Want to know what the movers and shakers of New Hampshire's performing arts are thinking? Welcome to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. This is Ray Dudley, Artistic Director for Square Peg Productions. And what a packed episode is coming up. My guest is Catherine Martinez. Catherine is an actress, a singer, a songwriter. She's classically trained in opera, and she's co-host for the paranormal show, The Ghost Girl Diaries. She talks all about what it was like to audition for Disney, the Boston Opera, and The Voice three times. Then she spills the beans on how she went about creating an album in Boston with no money, no band, and with the hope of inventing a new musical genre. And if that wasn't enough, she then gives us the details about her ride from fan to co-host of the paranormal series, The Ghost Girl Diaries. Holy smokes. But we got it all in, so grab your favorite beverage, lean back, and enjoy. Well, my guest in studio today is Catherine Cat Martinez. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I'm really looking forward to this episode because we chatted probably a year and a half ago in a little coffee shop when we were performing Christmas Carol. And it was one of those conversations that it didn't have to go anywhere. Right. It was just two folks just chit-chatting about life, some aspirations, what may or may not have or may or may not ever come to fruition. And now to see what you've accomplished since then, to me, has just been mind-boggling. It's very <laughs> impressive. It's very inspirational. And so I'm really looking forward to your insights into your life, into all that you have done, how you got here, and where the future is for you. And then I would just love for you to be an inspiration to other women and other young girls who are maybe struggling with identity or accomplishments and have you talk a bit about how they can get there. There's so much to unfold in your life. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I know. You know, I think a good start would just be starting with the music. You okay. know, that was my entire life. It literally encompassed my entire life, even from the womb, being in my mother's womb, because she was an opera singer. Both of my parents are professional opera singers, have owned multiple opera companies, you know, around New Hampshire. And, you know, that was really inspirational in a sense for me, because they were really successful in that, really sharing their knowledge that they had, because my mother was in Phantom of the Opera in Germany. She played as Carlotta. Yeah, so she's had that experience. And my father um, was really good with working with kids and getting like that basic structure of getting you on your feet as a vocalist. When I first started out in the music area of just classical opera, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that it was a part of my life and I knew that maybe at some point we would meet at that road. But I think just being surrounded by it wasn't really exactly what I wanted to do. So I decided to do more musical theater. Not much of a dancer. I did take dance when I was a kid. I know the um, well. Oh my gosh, the struggle's real. Um, but I just love to perform and be on stage. So I said, all right, you know, let's do some musicals. So I did some musicals, nothing crazy community theater, but made some great relationships with people, um, cast members, directors, and that are now like family to me. And that's really what I liked about it. So starting then from music theater, I started getting you know, a little bit older, like 17, 18, starting to figure out maybe what I wanted to do as a career. And I knew it involved music, but I didn't really know what. I did go back to the classical. I did go to Plymouth State uh, for a short amount of time. And, you know, if I'm just being raw and real, um, school at the time for me just wasn't, I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. So I did leave Plymouth State. I, I did great get great knowledge while I was there, but I wasn't 110% focused. And I think that's because classical wasn't the what I really wanted to do in a sense. So I wasn't interested in it. So I'm not going to continue to pursue it, you know, but it was always in the back of my head. I love singing it now, but it wasn't forefront of what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So then, you know, I just started working full time, had a few part time jobs as well, you know, doing some receptionist work as well, and picked up a ukulele, taught myself how to play ukulele, and was like, well, why don't I start to do contemporary covers? You know, because I like pop music, I like a little bit of everything. So then I started doing that. Wait a minute, you're thinking of doing contemporary <laughs> covers with a freaking ukulele? Yeah, yeah, I do. I have a few on my Facebook page. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> By the way, anybody can pick up a ukulele and learn how to play it. It's it's a great yeah. starter instrument. You could. You yeah. probably could. <laughs> 
<laughs> so when I started doing that, I was like, you know, I actually kind of like Disney now. Maybe I want to try to do some like Disney covers and incorporate that with like music theater. So then I started singing Disney covers on my Facebook page. And that inspired me onto the next step of my journey, which was why don't I audition for Disney? So there were a couple of auditions I went to in New York City to audition for the cruise line, as well as um, I think it's in Tokyo. I think there's a Disney in Tokyo, somewhere in that area, to just be a performer, you know, one of the princesses walking around or doing one of the stage performances. Mm -hmm. And those those experiences are, if you're wanting to do a music career, really life-changing because you learn a lot from it. You learn what types of people you'll bump into when you reach that level of going to go out and audition. You learn how to present yourself in front of this small panel that works for Disney that's heard the same 10,000 songs, you know, and are just annoyed and just kind of want you to finish up. But every time I went to audition, they had me sing the entire song. It was required that you would only sing 16 bars, which is your typical, but they had me sing through the entire song. And every time they kept telling me, you know, you're almost there, but you're just not ready. We just don't think this is the right time for you, or maybe it just wasn't a good fit. So I really took that to heart and was upset at first, because, I mean, not getting an audition or, you know, a role after you audition is hard for any performer. But I took that and used it as fueled for the fire and was like, okay, what do I need to work on? You know, and then started taking voice pretty seriously, started studying with my mother because she's just got like so much knowledge from, because she started out music theater, right, Mm -hmm. in Phantom of the Opera, but then she also went into the opera background. So she had a little bit of both. It's great. So started diving into that. And, you know, it was really strange because eventually that also, that journey also kind of died down a little bit. And I'm like, you know, I did it, but I don't really think that's something I really want to do. So I started thinking in my head, I'd love to have a band because I love rock too. I love rock. And, um, And you love the ukulele. And I love the ukulele and I love opera. You know, it's it's like ADHD. With what music. a marriage. It's so bad, I know. <laughs> but when I started uh, having these ideas about having a band, that was the time that I met Ray. We were in Christmas Carol together. He played as Marley, and um, he did a fantastic job. I was so impressed with him. So he and I chit-chatted a little bit, and I really wanted to get his input on what he thought about the, this next chapter or what I was planning on doing because it just seems so out there. And Ray is just such like an all-around great guy, so I know he probably wouldn't have thought of I it. didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> I'm not not. sponsored, okay? (laughs) This is not an ad. But, you know, I knew that he would be accepting of this new chapter that I kind of wanted to start. So I started relaying to him my ideas about the band and what I wanted to do with the band and just kind of create my own genre. You know, my goal as a singer-songwriter, which happened over time, periodically, I wanted to create something where someone would listen to it and they would say, you know, this doesn't sound like anybody I know. And that's the goal because I wanted to create something that's new. Kat, I, I want to take a minute just to emphasize that, what you just said. Yeah. Your goal was to create a new genre of music. Yeah. That's breathtaking. <laughs> Well, because most people would say, what, there's not enough? I mean, if you go to iTunes and you look down through genres, there's got to be hundreds. And for you to think that there's a unique place still yet to go, first of all, is impressive. Second of all, that you think you can create it is even more impressive. Thirdly, you're not afraid to go try to do that. That is crazy to me. I just really wanted to pause to let people understand what you just said. I needed that to digest, that you wanted to actually create a new music genre. That's wild. That's what. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. The fact Thank you would even verbalize that is amazing to me. Mm, it was really out there. And I think that's why I was so hesitant because I've had the idea for a long time, jumping back and forth from opera, music, theater, contemporary stuff. And I was like, you know, I'm kind of bored. Uh, don't get me wrong. These genres of music are great. But in the greater scheme of things, I I don't listen to music now and get that feeling of like, wow, this is new and refreshing. Like, this is great. It's just the same kind of monotone. Everything's based off of a specific genre, and that's just it. So I wanted to create something unique. And it was just really strange how it's strange when you pray on things or meditate on things and put things into the universe that if you you believe it enough, it comes back to you. Opportunities come to you to make that happen. And that's exactly what happened. 
I had a full-time job that I loved at Lincoln Financial Group. I love you guys so much if anybody's listening, and I still miss my job so much because I just loved going to work every day. But sitting at a desk nine to five wasn't the goal. And and it was really hard because I was trying to do some side gigs here, singing at churches for a while, doing some funerals and also doing community theater shows. Um, but it literally was like two full-time jobs. And it was hard because I was trying to market myself as a soloist sure. while still going to rehearsals, you know, for a community show and then working 60 hours at a job that was in overtime constantly. It was hard, you know? So I was really looking for something that would help me kind of just dumb everything down. I had all these ideas in my head, but it was really hard for me to pick one thing and stick to it because I have just such music ADD is like bad. So I came across something on Facebook. I was just really like beating myself up because I'm like, I have this idea and I think it's great, but I, I don't know how to start. It's going to cost so much money. I don't want to go through an industry and spend my life auditioning for the music industry because that in itself is just a mess right now. And I said, I want to do this the hard way and by doing hard work. So I was actually scrolling through Facebook and I saw an ad for a group called uh, Plaid Dog Recording, which is based out of Boston. And essentially it was a new recording studio that was based off of 100% crowdfunding. So what that means is the artist would be given the tools from this studio in Boston to put music out there, create a song at a professional studio in Boston for free to market themselves and teach the artist how to create an Indiegogo page or a GoFundMe page to raise money and funds for a project that they're doing. And it was a lot of hard work. I put in a submission and they emailed me back within 20 minutes and it was great. So it was really great working with the studio that was also kind of new with this new idea because it's the only studio that is based off of 100% crowdfunding. So the artist does not have to dish anything out, any money. And that's hard in itself because studios are so expensive now. So I started a GoFundMe or not a GoFundMe, it was an Indiegogo page that's um, kind of like GoFundMe, but it's a little bit more music based. So you have like perks, people will donate money went through a budget with the studio and they said, all right, you know, you have this idea for a band, but at the time it was just me. I didn't even have a band yet, guys. (laughs) Like I was jumping the gun with a band name, trying to figure that out. I wanted to create a band album, but with no band. So this- In a genre you want to invent. In a genre I want to invent. Exactly. So this poor producer, Mike Davidson, is like one of my best friends now because he really taught me a lot about, you know, studio lingo and how to go about things. And because I wasn't versed in that. I was verse on stage but not in a studio so yeah he we met we kind of talked about the project a little bit and he first off i rock was like his favorite genre he used to play in rock bands so it was really kind of strange how that ended up working out. It was like another universal connection that I was working one-on-one with a guy that owns the studio that has done tons of rock music before. And he was like, this is amazing. So we took it and ran with it. He did a lot of the guitar uh, parts in the album. It was going to be a five song EP for the band. And I figured, you know what, this would be a really great opportunity because even though I don't have a band yet, it'll give me time to work towards that. One. Two, I would have an EP album that was professionally recorded in Boston. Boston to get us started into the music industry or being well, you know, becoming known. Yeah. Uh, so I was trying to do the groundwork before actually making it happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's hold on just a second. Yeah. I'm still trying to get my, my head wrapped around. There's this guy who owns this studio. He's probably sitting back thinking one day he wakes up, I need something new in my life. Mm-hmm. What, what can happen? In walks a woman who says, hi, I don't have a band. I don't have any band members. I want to invent a new genre. Can you help me? <laughs> I know. It, like, oh. it, was, it was crazy, too, because Mike's face was like, what? You know, because yeah, I'm I telling imagine. him my ideas, you know, but a lot of it didn't really make sense because I just I had this creative brain and I was just kind of like verbal diarrhea saying yeah. everything that was in my brain. And he kind of was able to take things from it and kind of conjugate something that made sense instead of me being like, I want to do this and this and this and this and this. And he's like, all right, slow down, wait, and helped me make it happen. Before we go too much further, because you just laid a lot on the table here. Mm -hmm. You just went through 55 phases of your life in 30 seconds. (laughs) I want to back up a little bit. Yeah. When you said that you were classically trained or, or, or opera was your background, peel that back a little bit for us. Give us some basic, besides the fact that it was playing in your house when you were young, Mm. what, what kind of training did you have? I think that having parents 
verse in music and having had the opportunity to watch them teach others, teach kids, teach adults, go through master classes, watch them teach voice lessons. This was happening in your home? This was happening at our home sometimes and studios, you know, whatever, you know, studio we were renting out at the time for the company, watching tech rehearsals. And I feel, I know now, I mean, then I didn't realize it. But when I was a kid, I was soaking it in like a sponge. And I just thought everybody knew that knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, because that was my life. Yeah. It wasn't like I was sitting there, oh, my parents are opera singers, you know, I mean, right. just God, this is just great. My life's great, which it was great, but it, well, that wasn't normal. Now, as from a performer's perspective and just being grateful for this timeline that I've been given, I can look back and say most of my training was watching. And I feel that, yes, voice lessons are great, which I did do. Mm -hmm. um, at first, it was really difficult, again, just being raw and honest, to take voice with your mother because, of course, you just think, oh, it's my mother. She's just correcting me to be a putz. And, but again, I didn't realize how important that was until I got older. So now, obviously, we have a better working relationship, and I'm, again, soaking in everything like a sponge. Watching and learning from a different perspective of not being the performer, I feel like is really important and kind of lost. A lot of performers will get their credibility based off of being on stage or based off of, you know, who they know, and that's sure. great. But, you know, I remember my mother telling me things when she was my age wanting to pursue music that she would go into open rehearsals for the Metropolitan Opera or local opera houses and sit down with a score of the show they were working on and marking things and her watching other singers and saying, oh, wow, you know, she really had to take a big breath before that line. I haven't been doing that. Let me mark it down. That's incredible. It is, and it's so lost. But again, I just thought that was normal. So kind of going into it, I, I guess, I don't know. It's going to sound, it's going to come out weird, but okay. I think that having parents that were naturally talented, I was also giving given that natural talent. Sure. So things were a little bit easier for me from a performance perspective, just because I watched everything. I knew the basics and don't get me wrong. I'm still learning today. Mm -hmm. You know, I, absolutely. You know, but I was able to get by and without real formal training until, you know, you hit the real world and you now want to go pro and you're like, wow, if I walked into an audition room, they would know that I don't know my stuff because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just natural talent. You also need to work for it yeah, too. For that was a big eye opening moment for me to sit down and say, you know what? Like, just because I was given this gift doesn't mean that I, I know it all. So I went back and did the voice lessons and really wanted to learn the basics. Teach me everything because I really feel like going back to that is important, even as a seasoned singer, because you, we don't know everything. There is always room to learn something, and that was just a great experience. So how many years of voice did you end up taking? On and off, it was about four or five, and it was really on and off based off of, you know, obviously I was working a lot of jobs at that time. I was still trying to figure out what genre I wanted to do, and that was also a really difficult transition point because I was constantly being told just from a class classical standpoint that I need to pick a genre. I need to pick one. And I don't I didn't like that. And and that's and that's what I was explaining yes, to Ray. <laughs> I know. I, I was explaining to Ray, I said, I understand it from a vocal performance perspective. Obviously you can't be sitting there singing opera, you know, Mozart opera and then singing rock the next day because vocally that's taxing unless you really know good vocal technique to help you not hurt yourself. But I didn't like that. I didn't like being told I can only do one thing and that's it. Why can't I do a little bit of everything? So that is what essentially inspired the contemporary, doing some Disney, doing some music theater, doing some classical operas, a little bit of everything. I do not want to skip over the Disney thing because I think there's an education that needs to happen about that process hmm. because it's important. Rejection's important. Mm -hmm. They're doing the homework to be ready for that is important. So give us an idea of how you found out about it, what you were hoping to achieve. I mean, besides the fact that you wanted to play a character. I want to know what you learned. How hard was that process? I know you said that they let you sing a full song. That's rare. And, and I don't think most people would really get that. Right. And so tell us, take us backstage. How many other people were there? Is it intimidating to see that many people trying out possibly for the same job you're going for? Oh, definitely. Go through the Disney story for a second. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> being, you know, 18, 19, which was around the time that I was auditioning for uh, Disney, the theme parks. I, I'll be honest, I went to these auditions unprepared because, again, I had that mindset of 
well, I know the basics, but you learn and grow, you know, and you realize things. And it wasn't meant in a context of, I know everything. It was just meant in a context of, I have a, I have a talent and it's easy. You know, I can pull off auditions easy, but you do, you can look easily online for anybody that's interested. They're still going on now. Disney does have auditions listed up to like, I think six, seven months and they're open call auditions. So from 11 to 12, X amount of people come in, you don't know. Sometimes you'll be squished into these <laughs> into these buildings or these rooms because people will come rushing in, signing in a book, getting themselves ready for these auditions. And as soon as 12 hits, they close the book. Doesn't matter if people walked in, you need to leave 12 o'clock, open call's done. So they take X amount of people during that time, which can be really, um, really intimidating because at first, like I was feeling confident. I went with an opera singer friend of mine who actually um, lives in New York City and she's done them before. So it was kind of nice to have like an older inspirational figure with me to kind of help me through it because I didn't know what the heck to expect. I honest, I'll be honest, I didn't do research. I was like, cool, Disney, let's audition. And I went. <laughs> so I picked a couple of, you know, music theater pieces and went in. But the different energies you meet during these auditions is a very unique in itself. You have the people that have had all the experience. So they're chit-chatting away, talking about their experience, which can intimidate people that don't right. know, right? Well, you still have now, which is, that's fine. Good for them, but maybe not in an audition. You know, and then you have the really shy people that are looking around like, oh my God, you know, there are so many people here. They look just like me or the same characteristic to the same voice type. I don't think I'm going to get a role. And then you have the ones that are singing really loudly, you know, belting in the other room and you're like, come on guys. You know, so it's a mix of emotions. I felt like for me personally, I almost didn't have time to be intimidated because I was so busy trying to soak in what was around me because I had a bigger goal in mind. So for my personal journey, um, it wasn't really intimidating. It was interesting to read these. How much energies. time do you have when you go in? For the open call? Yeah. It's an hour. And it, no, you, you, you don't, don't get an hour slot. Oh, no, no. You don't get an hour slot. Right. No, it's 16 bars. You're in and out. They're done. You have 16 bars to impress these people. Mm -hmm. What are they looking for? That's a good question. I'll be honest. Disney is extremely appearance, looking for appearance. You need to be the right body type, especially from a female perspective. You need to be the right body type, the right height, have the look, have the eyes, the weight was a big thing for me at that time. I was struggling with weight at that time, so I wasn't as confident in an audition setting, you know, at that time. But it is definitely music related, but I think going into an audition and picking something that they might not have heard in a while or at all is very important. A lot of people will sing, you know, the Little Mermaid stuff for right. your typical music theater stuff that's usually rotated in auditions. So I decided to take a step back. I did sing a Disney piece. I sang um, God Help the Outcasts from Hunchback of Notre Dame. It, it was in a little bit of a higher key, so it wasn't like an, an alto range. But... I really felt after doing my research that this piece would set me apart from everybody else because of the message behind it. It's a gorgeous piece, gorgeous lyrics, very empowering in itself in lyrics. And I really felt that I could portray that. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. So, you know, usually they'll raise their hand up after 16 bars and they'll tell you right there if you got a, a call back or oh, whatever. They yeah, they'll tell you right there. And they told me to keep going. They put their hands up at 16 bars and they said keep going. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> when you were done singing the song, mm. what was it they said? What did you take away from that? Was it just a rejection? Did they say thanks and, and you're on your way? Or you mentioned that they said something about you're almost there. They did. So it was really strange because I went, like I skipped a year in between. So the first year I went and then I waited another, I waited a year and then I went the next year. And both times were the same thing. It was they heard my entire song and they took a beat after I was done. And the first time I went, the guys, so there were two girls and there was a guy in the middle. He started laughing. And I, I was, I was like, Oh my God, is this something on me? Like, why is he laughing? I'm not trying, you know, this was not a sat or a laughing piece. You know what I mean? And he said, your tone is impeccable. He goes, and you have potential, but you're just not there yet. And, and I, of course, like at the time, like I knew just from watching my parents hold auditions that that was definitely not the normal thing that they usually wouldn't take the time to sit there and tell you what they thought uh, from a performer's perspective, because they don't have time. They don't have time to sure. sit there and give you notes about right. that. They've got 10,000 people sitting there in a room that they just need to get in and out. And it happened a second time. It was a very, very similar context when I went um, two years after the first time I auditioned and um, it was the same panel. So I think he knew who I was because when I walked in the room, he was like, 
is this chick because they'll write your name down. So if you don't get if you don't get in, but but they kind of think you maybe work on it or you'll be back, they'll keep your name on file in a sense. Yeah. So and the same thing. So after that second time, I had an opportunity to audition for Boston Pops to be a soloist for Boston Pops, and I was really beating myself up after the second <coughs> Disney audition because I'm like, what the heck else am I doing wrong? Like I I felt like I excelled a little bit, but I was really frustrated because I didn't know what else they wanted from me. Did that note? You couldn't pull that I, note you apart, do, right? What, no. what did that even tell and you? you? Can't even ask them anything because right. it's they gave you that information so you just got to go and be like okay I know and what it's you're gold saying. if you can figure it out absolutely it's the key they're giving you a key right to get in yeah absolutely so then when i went to go and audition for boston pops i sang an operatic piece Mind you, at that point, I was headstrong into the voice lessons because I was like, I need to figure out what the heck's going on because I, I don't understand what, what they're doing. You know, is it my diction? Is it my interpretation of the character? Is it maybe the way I'm singing it? Maybe I'm not using as many dynamics. You know, simple simple things that can be fixed, but I was working on it pretty hard at that point. And I didn't understand. So I went to go on audition for Boston Pops. I was so proud of myself in that audition because I hit every note. And, and it was a good piece from Deflator Mouse. The opera Deflator Mouse is an aria. And I was very, very proud of myself. But the guy who was, who was the artistic director for Boston Pops, um, I had an in from a friend um, and he wanted to hear me sing. He told me it was very beautiful. He loved my color, but he feels like I need to take control of the music more. And in, in a sense, an example, if the pianist is moving kind of slow, you need to move them along. You can't sit there and let them do what they want, you know, if it's not working for you. And, you know, he said to come back and audition another time when you're ready. So I didn't, I didn't book the gig, but when he said that, and he said it from a different perspective, um, in a different way, it made sense. Mm. It made sense as to why I wasn't getting these gigs because I was letting the pianist or whoever instrumentalist take my time essentially from auditioning. What a great point. And how how weird is that? Because it's such a simple concept. You know, you think I got all the basics down, you know, I'm I'm opening my mouth wide, you know, I'm I'm pro I'm projecting enough, the diction's there. What else could there be? And I never even thought about that. And I left that audition feeling more empowered than ever because I finally got it. Kat, that is a brilliant point. And I think part of it is because we get so intimidated going to an audition. Mm. We forget that we are the product. Right. We are we should be in control mm -hmm. but there's so much adrenaline going on there's so many so many uh peripheral things happening you've got the the music person over here you've got people watching you mm -hmm. your mind is just reeling that you forget that you control that moment that is just yeah fascinating i sang a piece from sound of music as well after my classical piece and um it was kind of slow it was a lot slower than expected but it went and the first thing out of out of the artistic dir director's mouth was was that too slow for you? And I didn't know. I felt on the spot. I, honest to God, I felt so bad because I didn't want to call out the pianist in front of me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Trying to help me at this audition and tell him, yeah, you were kind of slow. Because that's not my, like, I didn't want to be but he like, on stepping it. on toes. He knew it. Yeah. And he said, was that song too slow? And I didn't, I didn't really say anything. I'm like, oh, you know, it was fine, you know, without really answering the question. And he's like, you need to take control of that. That's important because you are marketing yourself and you are the singer so if he's moving slow you need to push him along and anyone that's watching you audition will know if you're two or three beats ahead of the pianist that it's not you it's him because you're trying to push it along i love you and that's why i'm glad you're here this is just rich <laughs> this is these are the things it's good people knowledge. need to know yes. absolutely this is yeah. inside knowledge this isn't something you're just going to get in a book mm -hmm. Maybe I'll write a book someday. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you're not Add doing that enough to the stuff list, right you now. Know, yeah. I'm creating a new music genre. Oh I'm getting ahead. I'm getting I know, ahead. No, no. <laughs> so thank you. That was you're welcome. beautiful. So now we meet in Lincoln. You've got in the back of your head creating this new music genre. You go out. You do the footwork. You create an Indiegogo page Campaign, or yeah. yeah talk about that how much work was that how, is that intimidating to set up is very it, why don't <laughs> i'm trying to say this from a positive standpoint because it, it was really hard for me because it was really new i didn't really know how to go about it from a social media perspective but it was about i want to say like two three months footwork and i almost quit about three times 
I'm not even kidding. If it weren't for my fiance telling me to, you got to stick to this, you're so close, I probably would have quit a long time ago. Um, which is also another really good point to surround yourself with empowered people, people that know your potential to help you through these difficult situations because it's not easy. You know, it's not easy when you have a dream and you want to make it happen. Yeah. So when you have those positive, influential people around you saying, you can't give up now, you're this close, it helps motivate you to kind of get your head back in the game because you can get lost in your brain when you're doing stuff like that. Essentially what you do, I needed to compile a list. I can't remember the exact number, if it was 200 or 300 names, but I needed to make a list of the people I knew in my life that would possibly donate money and an average of around like what they would donate. We wouldn't ask at that time, but they just needed a ballpark. Mm -hmm. So when they set their budget, it wasn't like out there, right. you know what I mean? So they right. would kind of work off of who you knew and, and the people around you. Um, it's brilliant, but sitting there in an Excel spreadsheet, typing in names, looking up Facebook names, calling people, you know, sure. that's a lot of work. And at the time I was still working at a desk job, 40 to 50 hours a week being a mandatory overtime. So it was um, definitely a challenging experience because, man. Does it feel awkward to think that you have to go out and ask for money? Is there oh something? Oh, God. I hate huh? that. I yeah. hate it. I hate it. But from a, an artist standpoint, musician standpoint, anybody that's in a band knows. It's starving artist wage. It literally right. is that. And, and you need the help to get yourself started to make a foot in the industry. Otherwise, they won't. They won't hear you if you've got crap out there because you don't, you know, have the money to put to put it out there. Nobody's going to want to listen to you. Yeah. So yeah, doing a GoFundMe page for bands if you see them here and there. I know it looks like a pain in the butt, but it's not because they're putting their heart and soul into a project that they've been working on for so long. And you know, one or two albums, one EP album, and a full length album will really put them on the path to get better gigs, start maybe getting more income for their families, and they can start doing the music, you know, to help support their dream. So when you see things like that, think about it from a dream standpoint. What, what's the money being raised for? For production. So for the musicians being used in the studio, the time the house, being these used. These are house musicians? They were studio musicians, okay. yes. Um, my guitarist that I have now in my band did play on one of the tracks, but that wasn't until way later that I got a, a band together to be able to play. Um, but yeah, we hired out my drummer on the album. is from Blue Man Group. He tours with them. He's awesome. Awesome. And it was just such, such a great experience, too, to be around people like that. Did you say he's with Blue Man Group? Yeah. <laughs> he tours with them. Yeah. He's a drummer with them. He's amazing. Name dropper. Yeah, you know, it's fine. Again, this is not an ad. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, yeah, so you raise the money for house musicians, the time to edit the music, which is a lot of time. It's a lot of, you know, fillers, making sure everything sounds clean. The tracks slide in, you know, nicely, you know, each track from the other. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So... Someone out there is thinking, oh, well, okay, cool. So I can go out and I can raise some money and I can get some studio time. What did that cost? So for a five-song EP, mind you, the studio in Boston is very professional, but also wasn't going to try to run me dry because they understand from an artist standpoint, it was 9500 for five songs so professionally basically done. Basically $10,000. Yes. Yes. And that's and a basic. That's that base. Yes, that's basic. For an EP, and I think that that's a really good start because if you do a crowdfunding campaign, and I raised that money in a month, nice. one month, and that was really empowering in itself because I had this dream, but I didn't think anybody would buy it because I've done opera music theater. It, it, people can easily say, what the hell is she doing creating an uh, you know, alternative rock album? Like, right. I'm not donating money to that. Like, you know, I've never heard her do that before, but everybody pitched in. Everybody. So you raised the money. And now what happens now? So I'm guessing that you were running parallel tracks while the money's being raised. You're trying to figure out things on the other side. Yes. I got to figure out some songs. I got to figure out some other singers perhaps that mm -hmm. are going to help out and mm -hmm. cover art. I'm, I'm guessing all of that has to be running at the same time because once you've got that funding, it's go time, right? It is. Yep. Yeah. It was a lot. There was a lot involved in it once the campaign went live. So I had to create logos. I had to hire a design guy to create stuff 
stuff for my merch. I had to create posters. I had to create stickers. I also was still in the process of trying to find a band. So that was really difficult, you know, putting out casting notice that that I'm trying to create, right? Also writing music. (laughs) I know, Ray laughs because he he did, he laughed like this too when I saw him we were talking about it. But it it came from a good place, you know, because not a lot of people will put themselves out there in an uncomfortable situation. And I feel like if you are determined and have a dream, you can do it. It's going to take work, but you've got to take the good with the bad and just keep blowing through it because there's a light at the end of the tunnel eventually. And let me tell you, it was a year and like two months to create five songs on an EP. Really? I am so... And I'm so happy with it. Like I listen to it and I just, I cry because it's just overwhelming sense of I worked my butt off to make this happen and it's here and people are enjoying it. I mean, that's such an amazing feeling. I don't want people to go into this blind. So forgive me for getting into the nitty gritty stuff, but you say I had to create a logo. I had to create posters. Did you outsource all that or did you do that yourself? So for posters, I created myself. For merch design, I did go through a friend of mine. He is a bassist in a band, another band. So I figured this would be great. I'm good friends with him. He'll kind of have an idea of like what the merch should look like. I told him my vision. The band's name is called Elm's Landing. I really wanted to keep kind of like a darker um, paranormal aesthetic with the band. So I went off of an elm tree. An elm tree is a very big mythical tree in back in history. So I was like, great, elm's landing. We'll do it like an elm tree. And I was telling him I want a tree involved, maybe some like fog, hey, you know, you, and then the did logo. Did you sign this? I did. Thank you. <laughs> You're I'm welcome. Looking at it, I'm like, what the heck? Someone wrote on my. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, it's me. I know. I I only had a silver sharpie. But Thanks. You're welcome. No problem. Yeah, Ray donated to the campaign, so um, he purchased an uh, hard copy album. <laughs> so I handed it to him today. Yeah, no problem. So he took my idea, and in one swing, he did beautiful. It's gorgeous. Beautiful work. Yeah, and the merch looks great. Merch looks great. Yeah. I have to send you a picture. I'll have to give you a shirt. Actually, I'll give you a shirt. Rock yeah, on. Mm-hmm. I'll yeah. message you later. Yeah, um, thanks. But yeah, we have it all up on the site. I also had to build my website. I had to redo my social media to create a Facebook page, Instagram page, Twitter page. Strictly for the music. Strictly for the music. Mind you, it's still at that time I didn't have a band. So I was also... Or a genre. Or a genre. <laughs> I know. I keep leaving it out. Um, so once I officially established the band, which was still in the process of doing the funding, I had to set up band photo shoots to make sure that we had up-to-date photos of all of us. I had to set up bios on the website. I had to set up a PayPal account as well to attach it so people can buy my merch. There's lots of little things that go into it. And I was still working full time at this point. So I don't know how I did it. I'll be honest, that wow. entire year is a blur because of how fast you had to work. There were no excuses. You were, had set in stone studio time. You had to be there. Time was money. And um, especially when you raise that money, it was definitely more motivating to be able to follow through and just get down in the nitty gritty and not sleep because you knew everybody believed in your dream. And there's no guarantee at the there end. There isn't. There isn't. For royalties in itself, even on like streaming services, there's pennies, it's penny change. It's when you talk about royalties, you're talking about being paid back to you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we're not making really a cut off of this. You know, we, and that's never been the goal. That's never been the goal. And that, that is why it took me so long to find band members because there are so many people out there that are just in it for the money. Yeah, they're great performers. Maybe they love to perform too. You know, I'm not putting words in their mouth, but a lot of it is money driven. Obviously, you have to survive, yeah, you know, and yeah. I, I I understand that. But I had a bigger goal to literally run myself dry just to have the opportunity to perform music that I created and yeah. with people that have the same goals and inspiration as me. And the band that I have now is my support group. Yeah. They're like family. Oh, yeah. And it's just great to have that same mindset of it's not about the money. So you've created this new genre of ukulele opera. Is that it's what this is? It's not ukulele opera. Your God. Is, well, you I know. Maybe you, that'll be my next this, album. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, five ukulele right. members all doing opera. I know, right? You know, that would be. No. Oh, man. So what is this genre that you've created? It's essentially alternative rock, unfortunately, uh, for now. 
for lack of a better description. Yeah, right. Yeah, I guess. It, there's lots of alternative rock out there, um, but there's so much diversity in my band. Like, myself, with the classical training, my guitarist, lead guitarist, David, he used to play in, like, a heavy metal band, so he's, like, more of a rhythm guitarist. My bassist went to Berkeley, so he's an amazingly talented bassist, did stuff for musicals and such as well, playing bass there, so he's awesome. And my cousin is the drummer, my cousin Kevin. He plays in 80s rock Band. So he plays covers. He Is played in local? Hampton Beach Which, and stuff. Oh, okay. um, you know, so yeah, he's from Hudson, New Hampshire. So he'll usually play around like the Nashua area and stuff. But it's just been really great to work with diverse musicians that have done a little bit of everything just like myself. So we're all kind yeah. of not sticking to one genre. And that's Thus the, the goal. ukulele. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Duh. Right. Oh my gosh. We haven't even gotten into the other things you're doing. I know. So quickly, because I, I want to be able to talk about your paranormal uh, web series, mm. where does this go for the future? What, are you doing this as you're doing the other stuff? I mean, are, are, have you got great plans for this? Or are you like, no, you know what? Yeah. I'm happy. I did it. I guess it could go both ways. My goal was to create a new genre of music and have a band, you know, and I guess you can say with an EP album, I did that. So if things took off with other things going on in my life and that kind of took a seat for a minute, I'm okay with that because I can look back and say, you know what? I did it. But the goal is to continue forward. As an original band, it's hard because not a lot of places have original music. A lot of bars and stuff prefer covers because it gets people in the bar, sure. money spent, you know, whatever. So starting out with a small EP like this, if anybody has a small EP and they're wondering where to go from here, congrats, the work's done. So yes. you can kind of sit back and enjoy it and see how the streams are doing. But really set up your social media. You have to have usually about 1,500 likes on your social media before any other places will be interested in you playing there. You're because talking about venues. To venues, yeah, because they want butts and seats. Two, reach out to local artists that are going to be doing small tours, East Coast or West Coast, and see if you can't open for them. EP albums are a great way for you to be the first or second band to play before a headliner for them to say, who, who's this guy? You know, or who are these people? I've never heard them before. For, um, and it gives you practice to play live, have the opportunity to play in a big venue. It's not necessarily paid because the exposure is going to be great. You'll get right. to play in front of tens of thousands of people, but that's more work. That's going to take a lot more work um, when the time comes for it. Right now, we're kind of just in a resting phase and yeah. enjoying it. We're going to be starting up band practices again soon. We do have some radio time coming up. I had a, a man approach me on our Facebook page from New Zealand, wow. um, and he runs five FM rocks radio stations, and he's been following me for a while, even before I started the band when it was just me. And he asked for me to send them a few of our songs. So we'll be having uh, today, actually, is going to be the first day. We'll be announcing it today. That it will be on New Zealand, five New Zealand FM radio stations, and they're going to be rotating about three or four songs off of my EP album. Good. Um, I Good know I'm so excited, and that's really marketable over in that area, especially in Australia. They're really big into rock, like pop here is rock there. Wow. And so, this is going to be a really great opportunity to maybe have other people reach out to me finally <laughs> instead of me having to do all the Google searches all yeah. day, which is also another goal. It's working out. Really and well you right wrote now. all these, is that true? Every single one. Yeah. Yep, every single song. And that's another whole, I want to get into that with you later. I yeah. just have so much to talk to you about. I know. But I really wanted to get into your headspace about what it takes to write a song. Mm -hmm. Are there more that are just percolating in there? And mm. But we're going to have to move on. We'll get, you just, your life <laughs> we'll get is there. Just so, I know, there's so much. <laughs> yeah. I do just because I want the tag here. Yeah. Um, you tried out for The Voice, correct? I did. Tell me about that. Three times. <laughs> Three times. What is that So like? it is literally, it is exactly like a Disney audition. Open call auditions, except there's no cutoff, really. People will come in by the thousands, stand in line. Thousands. Thousands. I, like, the first time I, uh, first two times I went was in New York City at the Javits Convention Center, and I was standing outside for, like, four hours. And that's not including after you get signed in, and then you have to sit and wait for another two hours before you even go and audition. Now, I had no idea what I was getting into contemporary wise. Huh, yeah, weird. I keep doing that to myself and you know, you just learn a lot from it. So I'm going to yeah. take that with a grain of salt. But 
I walked in my first time, I sang actually a rock song. There's a, a group called Paramore that I grew up with as a kid, listening to them, and she was like really big inspiration for me to do the rock. So I did sing a, one of her songs. Is this a cappella? A cappella. No instruments are allowed in the room. They do their own kind of like mock blind audition. They'll see you when you come in, but then they'll look at their computer while you're singing so they can kind of get an idea on if you have so that the audio factor. they're looking for. Correct. Yeah. yeah. They want to hear something unique. Now, the first two times I went in New York were great experiences, and I really wanted to go a second time after my first time, even though I got a no. They'll say, you know, if they're interested, they'll say, you, you, and you stay. The rest of you have a nice day, and that's how it will end. So if nobody's in picked in the room, they'll say, thank you for your time today. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're not going to pick anybody in the room today, but we hope you'll come back another time. Out of thousands of people. Out of thousands of people, and then waiting eight hours in line. So I'm just saying, prep yourself mentally, because that was really hard for me to come to terms with when you're standing and waiting for, for eight hours in angst, like, oh my gosh, am I going to get it? And then they're like, nope, see you later. Is anything running through your head? Because you're a trained singer at this point. Mm. Well, how do you, how do you not go, what? Yeah. Well, I was, I was trained in classical, but I knew I wasn't very versed in contemporary and belting. That wasn't my thing. Because okay. classical, I mean, I'm singing high notes and head voice, not chesting things. So I was still I was still learning, but I wanted a practice run. I, I kind of had in my head already I wasn't going to get in, but I wanted to have the experience and say I did it. Yeah, excellent idea. So, um, and I actually, through that first day, I networked with so many inspiring musicians that are now like doing really big things that I'm really, really proud of them. And we still talk to this day because you're in line for so long, you know, so you're talking to the people that whoever's literally next to you, um, like if you're sitting in the middle and the two people that are next to you, they're going to be in the room with you. So I'm like, great. This will be a good time to kind of chat, what not a feel nervous. Thing to do. Yeah. And it was really a great feeling because that's why I do the music. I, I love to perform, but I also love the social aspect of it. I love hearing about what other people's journeys was, kind of getting something off of that, or they can learn something from you, you know, networking. So you and weren't sitting there with air, AirPods in your ears, no. blanking everybody else no. out. No, but there is also still those people that would sit there and belt in the back corner, you of know, course. and they're like, okay, you, know, yeah. you should probably we be saving you. your voice for yeah. the audition, but it's yeah. fine. Yeah. But then the second time I went, same thing happened. Then I went a third time. They came to Boston, actually. And I was like, oh, thank God, because I didn't want to travel out to New York City again. This is it's a, it's a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was still working. So I went to Boston, and then I realized the connection. And this is another reason why I'm not a fan of the music industry. I never want to be bought out. I would rather do my own thing and not have millions of followers, but have a good following because it is all money driven. One, not a lot of artists, unless you're already making the millions, have create um, their ownership over creative content. So usually it's the industry that will mold you to what they want. And I'm not a fan of that. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of that. I feel like if you've been, you know, blood, sweat, and tears doing your music and then sure. you get signed by an industry that's going to say, you know what, you sound good doing this, but I think, yeah, you know, the trend is, is this way, so we should be doing it that way. And you don't get a say in it because you sign your name and blood on the contract. Right. And I'm not a fan of that. So, but still going and having the experience, maybe even being on this on the show would have been great because it would have been exposure, an opportunity to perform in front of bigger crowds. You're learning, you're growing. Yeah, so still. what did you find out in that? So day? I found out that they were giving red tickets to only 15, 16 year olds. And I had noticed that pattern the first two times I went to New York, but I didn't really think anything of it because I was too busy socializing. But after I had some, you know, experience under my belt, I started paying really close attention and realized for the third time when I was denied a third time, people, kids were leaving audition rooms with the red ticket. Right. So for American Idol, it's gold, but for The Voice, it's red. And then it all made sense. And I will probably never audition for The Voice again. And it's and it's not from the standpoint of, well, I'm not going to get in. So why should I bother? It's from the standpoint of I have a problem with that. And the reason I have a problem with that is because the industry, from what I have, this is my opinion, so I could be wrong. If anybody has any other input, let me know. We'll have a chat. But from what I've noticed, the industry will use people to mold them to what the industry wants. They don't want somebody that already knows what they're doing in the industry oh, because I they'll see. fight back. Yeah. Whereas if you take the excited kid that's not going to question anything and the excited parents, you know, because they're underage, they'll sign the contract blind. And then the industry has them as a money-making machine until they can't be used anymore. And I was sickened by that. Wow. I really had a problem with that because that's 
bad. These poor people that have, do have talent, you know, these 15, 16 year olds that are being hired on or under 18 have amazing talent, but they have no idea what they're going to be getting themselves into once they're signed or they get, they win yeah. because of how backwards it is in the industry or they want them to look older than they are. You know, that's another characteristic they'll do as well, where they'll, they'll look like they're 20, but they'll say they're 17. You're seeing that still on American Idol. It's, it's sickening to me as mm. a musician because they, they shouldn't be used like that as a money-making machine because they're young and the industry can rewire their brain. It does, is any of that a reflection upon the four celebrities? Are they part of that? I, I don't mean, think so. Yeah? No, so I think it's just from a producer standpoint, like from the show itself. They're the EPs and the people that are involved with putting it together. They're they're like, well, we've had a better experience. Look at American Idol. They're getting all of these young singers and they're winning, so let's do it with the voice. But then the other things start to creep up with, well, you know, we can probably just tell them to change genre and they won't care because they're getting a million dollars and the exposure they want. And right. that is not the goal. And, and they're the, thinking they're being mentored by all of these people and, anyway. And so why not follow their... And wonder why these people have depression and drug issues because yeah. they realize too late Holy crap. And and you see it even in the young actors and actresses today riddled with depression. And I'd have friggin' depression too. Sure. You know? I mean, how sad is that? Well, how sad is that? And we're not we won't get into the whole Harvey Weinstein we won't thing. Even, but don't even be, be on top of all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can see why they would Absolutely. Be. So I am content with my five songs, just chugging along, doing my small stuff, and I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Thank you for all of that. You're welcome. Tell us about this web series. Yes. So I was, so it's really weird how this, how this panned out. I'm working now for a production company called Ghost Girl Media. Um, they're based out of Vegas, Las Vegas, and they are connected with a Ghost Girl Diaries, right? It was created by the same person. Her name's Crystal Leandra. I've always had an interest in the paranormal, but never really thought about it, obviously, because I was doing the music all the time. When I went to college, I did do a paranormal class. They had like a, like a, what are those classes called? They're like a random class you can take or it's not. Electives. Electives, yes. And I was really praying and meditating on an opportunity that would come along for me to leave my desk job to be able to pursue the music full time because it just felt impossible at that point. I was, I was prepared to work literally what felt like two full-time jobs to get to my dream, which would have been fine. But then this series came along, Ghost Girl Diaries. I was actually at work one day and I'll listen to like music on YouTube or something like that while I'm working. And I saw a recommended video show up of this girl named Crystal Leandra. She's gorgeous, gorgeous girl, extremely intelligent. And I liked kind of like the paranormal aspect of it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to check her out. Ended up over like the past two weeks looking at all of her um, videos. She has like over a hundred videos on YouTube, 3 million views together combined in the channel over 3 million views, large subscriber fan base here and in the UK. Um, so really successful woman. And I was like, this would be a great person to like be inspired from because she's amazing. So I saw the video and for, I guess, what, two weeks, I was really obsessing over it. <laughs> I was really obsessing over her and her mindset because she had the same goals as me, but in a different way, you know, with paranormal. She really had this YouTube channel where she had major success on it and she would review shows because she is a filmmaker. She's worked as a producer on Travel Channel with Ghost Adventures. She, she was on Ghost Adventures and she was on uh, with Pilgrim Studios as a producer. And so she has major credibility and I'm really usually pretty big on social media. I probably wouldn't be on social media if I didn't have the music because mm -hmm. I could care less for it, but you have to with, with the music. So I didn't have a Twitter account at the time, but she was more active on Twitter. So I was like, well, I want to follow this girl. She's great. Created a Twitter account. Two days after I created a Twitter account, she posted she was looking for a casting for the series to go on a major streaming network. And because of her credibility already, I'm like, wow, this would be really cool because this might be an opportunity to work from home and be able to do the music full time. I'll be able to leave my desk job, you know? So I was like, this is a door opener and a half. Like how random yeah. how it came along. You know, it was like the universe just threw it, threw it in my lap. And I'm like, I'd be dumb to not take this opportunity. So I emailed them my resume, some photos. They wanted photos as well. And the production company emailed me back within like 30 minutes. Mind you, I was floored and not expecting it because I had 10 other thousand projects going on. And I was like, probably shouldn't be taking on another one, but why not? You know, what can happen? They'll say no. So I couldn't believe it when I got the email and I'm like, crap, 
<laughs> maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But I was really excited. Ended up having a Skype interview with her, with Crystal. We had so much in common. Very similar personalities. We're very big go-getters, you know, very goal-driven. So it was really great. It was um, it was a formal interview, but it didn't feel like it because we yeah. were bantering back and forth. She nice. was fascinated about the music and I was fascinated about the paranormal. So the interview went amazing. I was going to have a second interview and I actually ended up getting a decline email from the interview. And I was really like upset, obviously, because I think I thought it went really well and it, it really like was discouraging. So I sat there trying to re retrace my steps because I was really amped up about this opportunity and, and what it could help with other things in my life. And I was hurt. So I went back to my desk job and it was fine. I was just trying to get back into that mindset of it's okay. I'm still going to keep on doing what I'm doing. You know, you can't stop now. So I had actually had a couple weeks went by. I was still following her on social media and I had actually had a dream about her. And we were in like this house and I woke up and I was very angry when I woke up because I'm like, what the heck? Why can't I let this go? Maybe I was thinking about it. I had a dream about it. The next day she posted that the, the opening was open and available again. Something didn't work out with the person they hired and they needed somebody to fill the position. So I was like, this is the time to email her back and say, is there still an opportunity for me to join you guys? At the, at the time it was for location management. So it would have been, you know, me looking up paranormal or haunted locations, right, for the series. So I was great with that because I love history as well. So she emailed me back immediately and said, here's my number, call me. And I was like, holy crap, because <laughs> I was not expecting that. And she goes, I should have trusted my gut and I went against my gut and we should have hired you from the start. And you're, so you're hired. And, and I didn't oh even goodness. know how to, you know, and obviously she was like, you know, take a second, you know, think about it. And I'm like, I don't need to think about it. I don't need to think <laughs> I mean, about it. I've been thinking about it for two weeks now. Like, you know, so it happened and I was able to give my two weeks at work and started working from home. And then we got more into if she was like, if, if I was okay with being in front of the camera. I, it's been about over nine months now, a little over nine months now. I have now been hired on as film producer behind the scenes. Um, thank you. I am also co-host now for the series and and paranormal investigator as well so I'll you know be holding the handy cam and doing you know other things in front of the camera as well as behind the scenes we did I can't get into too much detail right now because I signed an NDA so we can't go into specifics but from what's already been put out there we filmed a pilot episode to submit to streaming networks and uh, it went great it went very, very smooth. We were out, the crew and I were out for like 10 days and we just, it was a great experience just to be on set, learn the lingo because it was still very new. We went under intense film school training because one of our camera techs has already done film school training, but right, it's always good to just make sure, sure you know your basics. And I needed to know the lingo. I need to understand different camera angles, you know, plus it was really great because she does reviews on like ghost adventures and other paranormal shows from a filmmaker standpoint. And I really found that fascinating. So I really wanted to learn as well about camera angles and everything that I might not specifically be working on, but I'll be able to recognize from a producer standpoint, if something's not right, I can let Crystal know. And from a review standpoint where I can take a back seat and not watch it from a viewer standpoint, but from a filmmaker standpoint. Sure. A and, little more critical. And, Absolutely. And it opened the door into so many other things. So we're in post-production right now, which just means that we're cutting the film and uh, putting the episode together. And it's very exciting. It's very exciting. I saw that you ended up having to travel for this. Did, yes. So it's not local. It's not. Um, the production company is based out of Vegas in the West Coast. So I've been flown out uh, about four times now to just get hands-on with the paranormal equipment, do team building, becoming friendly with the crew. So we're all like a big family, um, having experience on set, and also just becoming more familiar with just like the West Coast in general. Myself, and there's another camera tech on this series. Her name is Chanel. Um, she lives in Pennsylvania. So we're very not used to West Coast. We've both never been to West Coast. So we had to get used to the time difference. And, you know, we'll be filming out there for the first couple seasons. So might as well get used to it now. This is not a spoof, right? This is... This is real. Yeah, this so is 100% real, raw, unscripted documentary style of paranormal investigating. You're going into a house? Yes. Or, or... it'd probably be a business. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Visit, we probably will do residential at some point, but that's not like the So some main. structure. Right. Absolutely. Doing um, what? Investigating. So here's the it's thing like that really sets... Kind of <laughs> That's I'm my ignorance. I know. Right no, there. don't. No, it's fine. 
fine. The biggest goal that Ghost Girl Diaries has, and this is what really drew me close to, to Crystal and her brain and how she worked because she's brilliant. And her goal just from having experience in paranormal is everything on the paranormal side is so dark and demonized now that nobody can take it seriously. Paranormal has completely lost its credibility because of Hollywood. And unfortunately, you know, yeah, it gets money in the bank and I guess it gets views, but it's time to bring credibility back to paranormal. And we're all women as well. It, we're an all-female investigative and camera crew, which is also very unheard of in paranormal, and I am all for because it's time. But we are going to come back and bring credibility back to paranormal, as well as letting locations speak for themselves. You go to a place that's two, three hundred years old, you don't need to add dark stuff or I'm being possessed or there's a demon in the house because the history in itself is so rich. It just, you don't need to do anything else to it. So we're really excited to just kind of bring a more raw and realistic standpoint to hopefully bring people back into the paranormal community. Flesh out that term credibility for me. You say it's lost credibility. You need, you want to bring it back. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? In order for people to believe it, mm -hmm. you know, people see ghosts and they'll think Scooby-Doo or Ghostbusters right. or take ghost adventures, for example. They're very dark now. They're very big into like, oh, there's a demon possessing me or there's something happening here. Usually when things like that happen, it could be happening, but the, from a viewer standpoint, it gets old mm -hmm. and you're like, is it really? That seems a little dramatic. You know, is that really like, is this scripted? Because it seems like it. Ghost Adventures is not scripted by any means and neither will we be, but it's time to bring it back to a more realistic standpoint where we're a bunch of fe strong, independent, smart females that are going to go into this location to help others if they're struggling with, with issues or they're afraid in their, in their business and they want to know what's happening. And we also believe that there is light in dark places. So sometimes you have to go into the dark to pull out the good from it. Take, for example, you know, you don't know what you're going to bump into. You know, from a paranormal standpoint, you don't know if it could just be a really angry energy or if it could be more of a demonic energy. Demonic is really, really rare to bump into, by the way. So if anybody's listening, it is possible, but it's really rare. So, like, don't even think that... Exorcist just don't, just, just, Yeah, right. I mean, it happens, but it's very few and far in between. And there are are cases where from past investigations that Crystal has done, as well as maybe even a few others, where there have been trapped souls in dark places. So there are people that want to move on, be with their families in, in the sky or in heaven or wherever they believe that is, and they cannot go because there is darker energies keeping them there to feed off of it, to make them stronger. And that's our goal as well, is to go into those places and say, you don't have the authority to do that. You're not God or whoever, you know, you don't have the right to do that and help them get back to where they, they want to be. This is fascinating. So you're trying to put this all on film? I, I'm mm -hmm. not trying to understand so how... So it's literally like Ghost, Ghost Adventures. Have you ever yeah. seen Ghost Adventures? Yeah. We're, we are going for but that, but we're, that not, we're not going to television. We want to go to like a streaming service. Right. So... That would be You're trying to exciting. communicate with them or, or just are. establish that they're yeah, there? Yeah, so like gaining evidence for paranormal occurrences. So like take, for example, there's a business owner that's really afraid because there's poltergeist activity happening in their kitchen or glasses are being thrown and they're nervous to have patrons there because they don't know what's happening. It would be our job to research the history of what's going on, hit the nail on the head, try to communicate with whatever's doing it and either maybe tell them to stop or find the root of the problem to help the business owner be able to help get help themselves or make it more comfortable in this area. But as well as gaining evidence, not, you know, a lot of the places we go to might not be someone that's in need or in struggle, but the, his, the history in the building is just amazing or it's a beautiful structure and we just want to go in and experience investigating with entities that we might bump into that want to communicate and tell us their story or need help crossing over. So it's just, it's a very fascinating and it's very scientific. Um, you know, we have tons of paranormal gear like K2 meters that will read fluctuations in temperature for us to know and validate. You that don't have anything an where you don't want to cross the streams, right? That's... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, no, but it's just, it's been so fascinating just to even see it from like a scientific brain, how energy works and how it manifests and how, what orbs are, um, and what they look like. And, um, it's very, very interesting. It's me very, very informative 
taking the stigma out of paranormal is the goal, helping others and just having fun, mm -hmm. you know, being with people that love what you love to do and being able to travel and investigate old locations and be able to maybe even communicate with people that have passed on that are historic people. Right. Um, how fascinating is that? Now, you did say earlier on that not in this interview, but early before it, that you folks are thinking of coming locally. We are. We do have a location pretty much booked here okay. um, in, in Concord. Oh, in I can't disclose That's what, fine. but it's really exciting. It's really, really exciting. Th things are moving real quick. You know, we're in a good kind of quiet phase right now, just from a producer standpoint. Crystal is, you know, owner EP of Ghost Girl Media and Ghost Girl Diaries. So she is actually cutting the film as we speak, you know, and putting it into an actual episode. Each episode will be about 45 minutes. And what's even greater is that Crystal is such a huge advocate for other people following their dreams. So, you know, something she said to me that really stuck with me was just because you're working with me and helping me with my dream doesn't mean you shouldn't be pursuing yours. And she was really loving that I was doing the music and like once she had me sing opera for her when we went to her place. It was hilarious. No, I didn't bring it. I know I should have next time. But she wanted to help promote the band more because she knew how hard I had worked to create this and make this come to fruition. That we professionally recorded Ghost Girl Diaries intro song for the series that will be on the uh, uh, streaming That's network cool. and it's 100% to Elm's Landing. That's and I cannot, cool. it's not even released, not released yet. It will be, you know, obviously at some point and it'll be available on iTunes once the series comes out but it's so exciting and it's just great to just have that connection because then it just makes me it validates for me that this was the right path as out there as it is it's it's strange well congratulations thank you you are a busy woman I am <laughs> and I, again I, from that conversation we had in the coffee shop till to now, this is beyond inspirational to me. Are there any other things that you're focusing on at this point you want to kind of cover? No. I I mean, I finished a show. I did a show last fall. I did Camelot. I was uh, Guinevere in Camelot. I was in Pittsfield, in Pittsfield. Right? Yeah. yeah, Pittsfield Players. But it's been hard this year just because I really told myself that I, you know, I have a really bad tendency to take on too much at once. Hmm. And I really want... <laughs> really want to enjoy what I'm doing now. So I'm not doing any shows this year unless it's Christmas Carol, because I'll be doing that, you know, every December here in Concord. And that's really, that's going to be it. You know, I'm focusing on the band, getting some things that I need to get done with that. And once everything's good to go with the series, we're going to be hitting the ground running, traveling um, and filming for the next seven episodes Man. This, the, for the first season. So oh, I'm so jealous. I know it's, it's great, but you know what, if we're ever here on East Coast, and you're interested, we'll chat. I mean, we'll get yeah. you into an investigation or Maybe something. Maybe I can do Come like a experience. remote podcast there or something. Right? <laughs> hey, listen, that'd be awesome. Hey, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'd yeah. love to get I love to get Crystal here at some point and yes. chat with you and chat about her experience because she's just she's an amazing. If she gets human out being. here, let me know. I would Oh, I will. Her. That'd be fun. All right. Well, thanks for coming by. No problem. Congratulations. I can't wait for the future and Absolutely. see what's all going on there. But thank, thank you, you for me. having me. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks for listening. This has been a Square Peg production. And if you'd like to find out more about Square Peg and all that we do, you can find us on Facebook or at www.squarepegnh.com.